This is the future. And humanity is all but extinct. First they start skipping prescribed drug dosages. Then they begin touching. I volunteer as tribute! You can stop this. You can change things. I know that there's something more. Then we've only got one choice. We fight. Fight the future with Dan and Paul. Welcome to Fight the Future with Dan and Paul. I'm Dan. And I'm Paul. Today we're going to talk about our very first anime TV series, which is mm -hmm. called Knights of Sidonia. Right. For so this would be, I guess, our first TV series and I guess our second anime, if you count Nausicaa. That's right. Even though there's plenty of anime dystopias out there. Mm hmm. In fact, I guess a lot of anime actually takes place in dystopia when you think about it, because that's why you need the giant mechs to be stomping around. When things are going well, you don't need the giant mechs. <laughs> yeah, there's no place in regular civilized society for giant robots when you think about it. Mm. It's like we've got car areas, we've got pedestrian areas in our cities. Where do the giant robots go? Right, yeah. Out in the countryside? So yeah, this is giant robot anime. Of the classic type. Mm -hmm. Although not quite as giant of robots as sometimes you see. This is sort of what I would call a kind of medium-sized robots. It would be like a, uh, a tall <laughs> rather than a grande right. or a venti. Right, yeah. I believe the robot anime, the, the size of the robots can get up to be very, very, very large. Like what? What's the biggest robots? If I recall correctly, I remember reading about one where there's like robots that are literally like galaxy size fighting each other with <laughs> other with other galaxies. Whoa. Okay. That's way bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like two or three on top of each other. <laughs> so, no. I like the idea that like, you know, the, uh, like even, even if they could punch at like the speed of light. It would still take a really long time for the punch to get there. People would, you know, be living on this robot, you know, go through their entire <laughs> lives. I'm waiting for the punch kids. to connect. <laughs> anyway, that's not what this particular uh, anime is about. No, but it is in a also strange situation, which is a space station floating in space, which we'll talk about. Uh, the last remnants of humanity fighting mm -hmm. a, an evil alien threat in giant robots yeah so pretty groundbreaking stuff i'm being sarcastic Ooh, thank you for for putting that in otherwise i would not have known jab jab and parry mm -hmm. um this is from 2014 so it's yeah uh, modern anime with a lot of cool cgi stuff in it and i guess for the uh, in the context of sort of spoilers uh, we're going to be talking about the first season of the anime. Uh, we, uh, we're not going to be, there is at least two seasons and I believe there's going to be a third. And there's also a manga um, that I think is actually finished now, but we're not going to be talking about those. We're gonna, just going to be looking at the uh, first season of the anime, which is available on Netflix and I'm sure other places. Yeah. Yeah, the show is definitely not paced to end at the end of a season it's paced like they're going to have seven seasons plus 12 spin-offs plus mm. a reboot nothing is wrapped up tidily at any point no nope. there's lots of lots of fighting and flying of robots left to be had in the grimdark future there is only war not just war i mean there's other stuff too also flirting yes blushes furtive glances yep all that good stuff. Love tetrahedrons. I don't uh -huh. know. Some sort of higher mathematical shape. Well, whatever shape has one passive male in the middle and a whole bunch of extremely girly <laughs> girls orbiting around him. More more of kind of a wagon wheel. <laughs> or we could just say anime. Ooh, <laughs> another. Zow, wow. The claws are out this time. We will talk about this as a dystopia, the world of the dystopia, because we don't review anime, despite mm -hmm. my snarky comments. 
I mean, we don't review things. We talk about the setting, the plausibility, scariness, hope for the future, and imagine ourselves into the world of the story, which is a section we call, How Would They Do? Well, let's get going with the setting. The setting. So it's the future. Far, far future. I think this is something, I think we're closing in on like 3,000. And we're on this big ship, this uh, sort of colony ship, I guess. It's called a seed ship. And it's five kilometers wide and 29 kilometers long. And it's actually embedded in a giant asteroid, which uh, it becomes apparent is, in fact, a chunk of Earth. <laughs> really? <laughs> the, I've missed that. Yeah. <laughs> the, and so, as that suggests, Earth uh, is not doing so hot. In fact, I believe it is no longer there. Yep. It's been split apart by this alien race called the Ghana that right. really hate humanity for some reason that we don't know. Yeah, they seem to be just these, this like completely animalistic, giant sort of uh, amorphous blob things that are hell bent on attacking people for a reason that is not totally clear. Yeah, so they're basically like a blob of tentacles that come at you. And somehow they exploded the earth. They're very difficult to kill. Mm -hmm. They have this inner core that is almost indestructible. Uh, and, and so, yeah, human, human race, there were all these ships that came out of earth and they were all destroyed except for one, Cydonia. We actually know about two that were, that were successfully, they su successfully made it out. Okay. What does yeah. one of the others play a part in the story? No, but it's just it's it's referenced basically because but because they all have been going off in different directions. It's been like hundreds of years since they heard from this one, but it, oh, okay. it's mentioned in one of the things where they went off and it's like the last transmission they had from this other ship was like four hundred years ago or something. Uh, but now they're but they are all going off in different directions, so it's too far away for them to know anything about it. Yeah, I, it's not built inside an asteroid, I should say. It's kind of wearing it like a belt. And it yeah. looks like the barrel of a really chunky pistol. And uh, I believe they they use that, they like mine that asteroid for uh, whatever you get out of asteroids. Uh huh. Resources. <laughs> Resources I guess. of some kind. Yeah. Stuff to power their Hayden generators or whatnot. Right. Hagus. Hagus particles. Hagus particles. Hagus apparently. Particles. Yeah. Everything runs on Hagus in the future. <laughs> Turns out it's the most powerful thing known to humanity. <laughs> Send those haggis particles, those particles of delicious spiced lamb and rice. <laughs> oh, that would be great. You know, the these Ghana attacked Earth, and in desperation, uh, humanity sent off these seed ships when we're following this one that's been traveling through space for like 600 years. Like, we're way, way past when that happened. And things have actually been pretty quiet uh for about 100 at the beginning of the series things have been pretty quiet for about 100 years and then they become uh less quiet <laughs> mm -hmm. to the point where they they figured that they had sort of outrun the ghana or at least were in an area where the ghana weren't around but it turns out that is not the case and uh a new crisis l looms so society has been organized around very mil militaristic uh, basis, much like Ender's Game. We'll mm. probably come back to that a few times, but most people are part of the military in some way. Often young people are into this guardian force, are required to join this guardian force and train to become giant robot pilots. So these giant robots have been for a hundred years just basically flying around doing nothing and preparing for the day when a Ghana might come back. And in the series is when that day arrives. Mm -hmm. The other important part of it is that about, I believe about like a hundred years before the start of the series, which, which was the last time that they actually encountered Ghana, it totally wrecked the ship. Like uh, it destroyed a, uh, a ton of the ship and killed the vast majority of the people on the ship it was the last Ghana that they encountered. It was a really, a really nasty sort of uh, 
almost extinction event. They finally managed to, to win, but at great cost, and the population on the ship was so depleted at this point that they didn't actually have enough population to continue running the ship and to actually have like a, a, a viable group of humans. And so they started moving into doing um, cloning. And so a lot of the people that we in, are encounter on the ship uh, in the series now are clones. Which did not help me at all, considering that the character designs are incredibly similar otherwise. <laughs> Wait, are you the same person? No, I'm a clone. Are you the same person? No, I just looked like that person. <laughs> yeah, I just have like my hair in slightly different places. And they all wear uniforms, too. Right, yeah. And also, uh, and the other aspect of that is that um, their food supplies were so depleted that as part of the cloning process, they did genetic engineering on people to allow them to photosynthesize, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So rather than three meals a day, I think people can survive on like one meal a week or something. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as they expose themselves to uh, sun on a, re on a regular basis. Yeah, there's a wonderful scene of one of the characters needing to photosynthesize, and so she gets naked. Well, it is directed at teenage boys as well, and is floating in the view screen of one of these giant robots being warmed by the sun and absorbing all the nutrients from the sun. It's quite a beautiful sequence. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a social thing, too, that someone is like, I'll, I wouldn't go photosynthesize with you in a million years. <laughs> Jerk. That brings us to uh, sort of the main character, uh, who none of that stuff applies to, <laughs> or not not none of that stuff, but a lot of that stuff doesn't apply to, uh, is a, a guy named Nagate. Yeah, it emerges that he grew up sort of the natural way underground, um, with being raised by his grandfather to be a great robot pilot and kind of stumbles out one day and joins the modern world. Right, the idea is that this, that Cydonia, this ship is so big that this, this he actually, yeah, has been just living in the bowels of the ship for his entire life uh, and nobody knew that they were there. Yeah, so the population is about 500,000 people uh, and takes the form of like a huge city, essentially, that's built inside the spaceship. Mm-hmm. It even has like air above it and to the sides. So there's actually an outdoor still. Yeah. Uh, and there's all gravity there. They have sort of gravity generators and things. They also are on the spaceship with incredibly massive engines on it. And at various points, they have to, you know, turn the ship, which, as you can imagine, five mile long ship traveling at a extremely high speed for 600 years or whatever it's pretty tough to turn it and so when they fire the engines to uh to try and change direction it causes like massive damage basically inside the ship uh as it bas anything that isn't tied down gets thrown wildly into the walls and stuff so the story is about nagate getting fitted to be a pilot at the exact time that this new threat has arrived of the ghana coming back and it's basically about him and his buddies, who are mostly young women who have crushes on him, trying to repel this menace while being hindered by some forces within the politics of the world. And he ends up killing the first Ghana to ever come back and having a number of other great triumphs. Mm -hmm. They've discovered the only way they can effectively kill them is with the special spear that they've built from the special material called a kabizashi. So they only have like 26 of these special spears. They're good for stabbing Ghana. Yeah, and they're incredibly, yeah, they only have, they, they found them on this weird thing they found in space. They went and investigated it. They found these chunks of this stuff that they found out can kill the Ghana. And so they turned them into spears. But like, that's it. Like, they can't make any more of it, at least not at the beginning. How did they uh, find it out the first time? Like, hey, remember that weird rock we found? What if we try hitting the Ghana with that? Like, that was a creative leap. Like, did they try hitting the middle of the Ghana with everything else before that? All right. Like grapefruits. Go. <laughs> grapefruits. Silver-tipped no, no. arrows. Yeah. We've no, got... That, uh, that's, that's for werewolves. <laughs> yeah, what about quiche? <laughs> 
Go, go. It's, it's having no effect. We're losing more pilots. The quiche initiative is a failure. All right. Pull back. They haven't been able to replicate these things. So they've got 27 or however many of them. And that's it. That's the only way you can fight these Ghana. And so obviously they're very important. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the subjective aspects of this world. We've got its military dictatorship and mm -hmm. very much based on uniformity, not just the fact that there's all these clones running around, but everybody wears uniforms. Just, life is very regimented. Only some people are selected to be a fighter pilot, but everybody is sort of in support. Uh, you know, the, there's lots of sort of support personnel for the fighters. Uh, and then there's also just people who are living in the city and like operating food stands and stuff. But everybody seems to have a fairly regimented role. Like you never see like homeless people or anything in the city. And by the way, uh, people, it's implied that people are recycled after a certain age, a la Logan's run. Right, yeah. Put in these organic converter devices, organic converter reactors, and probably turn into food. Nobody really blinks an eye at that. No, no. There's only a handful of older people in this whole series. Basically, everyone looks like they're under 25. Right, and that's actually a point with the, the ruling group of the ship um, are literally called like the Immortal Council or something uh, because they're, uh, they're a group of people who, through whatever gene therapies and drugs and whatever else, have actually been in charge of the ship for hundreds of years. Right, and they're kind of reduced to little mummified heads in, in little hot tubs. Yeah, or at least most of them are. The captain of the ship is also one of these people, and so she's uh, she's walks around and stuff. But why doesn't she have to be in the spa thing herself? I guess you maybe maybe you don't have to be in the spa thing. Maybe they just, just like relaxing, it. yeah, <laughs> having a good schwitz. <laughs> yeah, after six hundred years, you're like, eh, oh, I'm all pruny now. <laughs> Speaking of which, a quarter of Sidonia is, is the sea is seawater with fish and things, which is interesting. Right. There's actually quite a bit of natural environment there, which you wouldn't really expect. Like there's a city, which is like a big, gigantic, massive tubes and huge buildings. And then there's grass in some places. Mm -hmm. there, but you don't really see any insects or animals. No, presumably everything is pretty tightly controlled even though it is like grass and stuff it's probably all uh, uh you know very art, art uh, artificially planted stuff and very you know tightly maintained probably not a lot of you know wild fields and things the one animal we see in the whole series is a talking bear uh, right who it turns out to be an, an ancient pilot one of the strike teams kind of going undercover as a lunch lady. Right. With the cyborg arm. At no point does anybody ever make any reference to the fact that it's a talking bear. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it. It's like, are we the only ones who see the talking bear? <laughs> Would it hurt them to throw in a few like Paddington bear type jokes like bear left? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's not only a, uh, she's not only a bear, but she's a bear with a big robotic arm, which is pretty cool. Cyborg bear in a spacesuit, which is what one entire episode is about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, there's something I like about this show. <laughs> <laughs> there's also people who are no neither male nor female, like the character mm -hmm. Izana. Right. She says, we have a new gender now. It's neither male nor female. I think the idea is that they can uh, voluntarily become one or the other at some point. I don't know how quite how it works. But. Apparently, when they become super into someone, they then differentiate into their preferred gender. Oh, okay. Like a frog. <laughs> right. They probably don't tell, you know, advertise it like that, but yes. So what that means in practice is that you grow bigger tits to match everybody else in this. <laughs> Like, she really registers as uh, female. I'm saying she because that's how characters refer to her in the show and how and she refers to herself, so I'm not misgendering her. And the voice actor as well. Not just 
female, but like ultra femme, like in a lot of anime. Super high pitched, squeaky voice. She just has short hair and smaller breasts. Mm. But it's still interesting. Yeah, and it's one of those, it's an interesting aspect of the world that isn't really explored very much. Like, I think she's the only one that we actually see who, who's of this sort of third gender. That's true. And she also has to keep explaining it to people, which is interesting if it's so common now. Mm hmm. One of the other aspects of the sort of clone things is there are like sort of clone groups that you, you encounter at different points. There's one main one that's the Honoka sisters that are 22 identical clone sisters who Holy pilot Lord. guardians. They, uh, they're they five years old and have undergone accelerated growth. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, this show is a soup of crazy sci-fi ingredients that lead to something that looks very much like everything else. <laughs> Plausibility. One of the things that I actually quite like about this series that uh, there did seem to be a lot of care taken with some of the sort of technical details when they encounter a Ghana, they're quite methodical about showing, you know, their their scanning systems and how they're measuring things and uh, the kind of things that you that you can imagine, you know, radar systems and stuff. And how how they don't actually have like a complete picture of the Ghana right away, they sort of have these kind of blurry satellite photos of it because it's really 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 far away because they're in space. Or it's an extremely important part of any kind of military encounter. It's not something. It's something that is often kind of hand waved in this kind of an action sort of anime thing. And so it's it's neat to see that actually being looked at seriously. Yeah, it seemed like they had a sort of routine for how to attack the Ghana. That was it, it's always kind of fun to watch that that they they have certain procedures and they're like, "All right, we'll attack the tail and blow off the tail and then we'll it's of the greater mass so we can attack the rest." It's almost bizarre how routine they do take it given that they have had generations with no combat whatsoever. Mm. The, and now they're facing an actual terrifying alien for the very first time. Right. I mean, the, there's the ideas, I guess, that they've been doing sort of drills for like a hundred, hundreds of years or a hundred years for just this exact occasion. Because, I mean, they know how incredibly dangerous these things are. Here's my issue, though. If you have an enemy that is basically a ball of tentacles that it can blast in every direction, why give it arms and legs to grab onto? Why have legs at all? In space. I spent, I spent a lot of time going like, why are there knees? <laughs> <laughs> when do they need to kick things? <laughs> what did, what, when might they need to kneel down or, yeah, walk? Never. Hmm. It's, a, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I'll, gi I'll give you that. Why not have everyone just pilot like a big sphere? Right. That would be hard to grab onto. Mm. Covered in, uh, you know, Vaseline. <laughs> yeah. Make it slippery. very slippery. Uh, or just have like scissors on every side. Like snip, snip, snip. Mm. You could, yeah, yeah you could uh, have some serious innovations in the, in the world of, I mean, there, maybe there, there might be a lot of, you know, we've been doing it like this for 600 years. <laughs> Tradition. Of course, next mechs need knees. How else are they going <laughs> to kneel down? <laughs> ridiculous maybe there are some maneuvers that involve like flying kicks or whatnot mm. that we never got to see we saw one guy detach his fist and shoot it at the alien right. rocket punch it seemed like they had hands articulated hands that uh -huh. they needed to load their weapons with individual bullets with the fingers of the hand right again but yeah why separate fingers? Chances of you needing to, you know, poke the eye out of a Ghana or something seem fairly slim. <laughs> Challenge yeah. one to a thumb wrestling competition. <laughs> you got to be prepared. You never know. What's it going to be? Like, the only reason for that is because of the tradition of giant robot anime, right? Or, no, oh, sorry. And it, I'll stay in world. I should stay in world. Well, I think... I mean, I think there is, I mean, even, you know, we can, 
I think we can talk about it, not necessarily in world, but I mean, there is an aspect of, uh, you know, watching a, a action sequence of a whole bunch of spheres attacking a tentacle thing might not be as interesting as humanoid <laughs> figures. Spheres remote controlled from the base in perfect safety. <laughs> <laughs> they're literally not used for anything else, right? Well, no, they're used for, uh, they do actually use them for like scouting and stuff at different points. I mean, the original reason why they, when they encounter the first Ghana, it's because they're uh, scouting like an ice asteroid to like do some mining. That's true. So they do some multi-purpose work. Yeah. They're not just, yeah. The, the like attachment formations that they do in order to get places faster. It's kind of cool. Yeah, that was cool. They'll hold hands and uh, attach together and I guess combine their power. I don't know. I was trying to figure out, but like from a physics perspective, does that actually make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> Do they go faster when there's four? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> yeah, they basically have these giant rockets strapped to their backs, like Wiley Coyote when he has the roller skates and the rockets. <laughs> right. That's why they need knees. Roller <laughs> the skates are useless without knees. <laughs> you make a good point, Paul. Yeah. So you pointed out earlier the acceleration thing, and I thought that was a great example of taking something really seriously that is normally glossed over, like the gravity. Mm. They have artificial gravity. And yeah, when you accelerate, gravity doesn't work so well, and thousands of people die. Right. There's like a section of one episode where Nagate, his job is to just walk around the city testing out all the safety there's like safety rails everywhere in the city and everyone has to wear like these special safety belts with like a carabiner on it in case you know the gravity generators mess up or there's something bad happens there's all these safety rails everywhere and so you can clip yourself in and so he has the mundane task of going around clipping himself to one of these safety rails and like leaning back and testing it <laughs> so he's the only person in the world who has to eat and shit all the time there's festivals with food in them, but for everybody else, it's like a fun treat type of thing. Because they only have to eat once a week. They get like little, yeah, there's like, you know, you get, it's like, oh, you get like a little like tasting plate or whatever of something tasty. And he has to eat like 10 of them before yeah. he's actually full. At first, everyone's like, ew, you're eating all the time. You stink. Right. You're I love that part of it, that if nobody ever burped or farted or pooped, or ate and had food on their breath, it would be super gross. Like, thank God we all do that. Yeah, the uh, uh, the photosynthesizing method is much more sanitary. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's just like, la, I'm in the sun, absorbing its wonderfulness. And you're over there putting meat in your mouth and masticating it. And they definitely mock him for that, which I like. And then pooping. Yeah, like, you have to poop again? Oh my god, it's disgusting. <laughs> this toilet was not meant for this much poop. <laughs> yeah, it blocks instantaneously. <laughs> Do we learn anything about the Ghana? Like, are they plausible or implausible? I mean, they're just... I guess it's you sort of empathize with the people on the ship in the sense that they don't know what the hell's going on either. They they're just they're just being attacked by these crazy monster things and they don't know why. And as the show goes on, we find out we we see that they have are sort of exhibiting more and more intelligence. Uh, you know, at first even just stuff like, you know, dodging attacks and things. But then also uh, uh there seems to be some sort of actual sort of deliberately uh, countering the uh, maneuvers that the pilots are doing. Not ever like super cunning. Like we never see them have a intense strategy or something. They just no. have. But yeah. they do like ambushes and stuff. Yeah. And, and no... they do. And they like learn from the tactics that they used on a previous Ghana too. Okay. But yeah, but there doesn't seem to be any organizing intelligence behind them. No. And there's, you know, any attempts to communicate or anything have been completely ineffectual. Yeah, one subplot is that at one point, the Ghana swallows one of the pilots, Hoshijiro, and eventually spits out something that turns into a clone of her, essentially. 
the red tentacles resolving into her body shape mm -hmm. and her kind of coming to life a little bit. Very creepy. Yeah. Nagate learning to talk. It could be interpreted as the Ghana sort of actually like deliberately doing something to creep to, to scare the people or something. Yeah, because at one point he has to deal with a squidgy alien that's formed itself in the shape of one of these giant robots, except it's all red, and keeps whimpering in the voice of his former friend as right. it is trying to kill him. So that was cool. And it has it seems to have the equipment and tactics and knees of uh, the regular <laughs> Uh, the rate of, of like a real ship even and even with you know faster and more capabilities and stuff so it's actually using not only like it's not just a ganda in the shape of a, a robot it's actually uh, seems to actually have like all the guns and stuff that one of these robots has which is weird yeah they have all kinds of different powerful weapons that are all ineffective against ghana except for the spears so they blast it with everything. So somehow this core of the Ghana is absolutely impervious to everything except for this special metal, no matter what kind of explosives or energy weapons they aim at it. Yeah, I mean, they literally shot a nuke at one. Yeah. So I don't know what the heck it's made out of, but... Scariness. For the hundred years, it was great. You know, our things were going fine. It was not long. great. You were well, recycled. Well, yeah, you recycled, but, you know, that was just part of the whole world. That just kind of happened. People seem pretty cheerful. Yeah, people seem pretty happy about it. But after the Ghana attack, like, you could literally, like, previously, one of them got into the ship and killed almost everybody on the entire ship. And so it's like, oh, my God, we're all going to die. And there's nothing really we can do about it. And, you know, they do defeat the Ghana in various ways, but every defeat of the Ghana is a lot of the, or at least a lot of the, a lot of the defeats are Pyrrhic victories at best. Yeah, with so many of their pilots slaughtered in every encounter. Yeah, and they don't have a ton of pilots. And obviously they're losing a lot of the, like, big mechs that they're building too. Guardians. Presumably they can't just build a ton of those. Yeah, no, it's very grim. Like the very first encounter with the Ghana, I was so scared for them because there's just this one ship left of all of humanity, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're so fragile out there in space. Yeah. Yeah, the society is, is very grim in many ways, even though people don't feel it who are in this society. Every, everything is very uniform. Life is very bland, it seems like. Mm. it's basically like like military school is what all of life is like it seems like we don't we don't know if uh, how much of that goes into sort of civilian life but everyone seems to be wearing uniforms and things yeah everybody seems kind of tranquilized to me like there's no evidence that they are but they just seem a little bit thin as far as people mm. go maybe partly that they're all really young yeah, I mean, there was the thing with the, you know, the there's the sort of rebellion or the, the thing of people wanting to leave the ship and stuff. So, you know, it's not completely homogenous. From like a, uh, a political point of view, uh, you know, the Ghana, in a lot of ways, are a mo sort of an ideal enemy, you know, in the sort of 1984, always at war kind of way mm. uh, for the ruling people to stay in power. You know, these there's these giant monsters that are incredibly terrifying that could show up at any time and we don't know why and there's nothing we can do against them except for our brave leaders and the guards and stuff so there there's no uh, no laws or no steps that the ruling people could take that would be out of line given the circumstances you know yeah in that state of desperation, there's no such thing as freedom. Right. Even the most basic thing of the captain doing the an emergency turn of the ship that devastates the city and kills, like, thousands of people. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of political pushback you hear about. People are a, a tiny bit upset, but there's they don't have to 
consult anyone. It's one person just says, let's do it. Right. Yeah. The, the captain is dictator and dictator. <laughs> the captain is dictator for life and she's immortal. So yeah, it's going to be a while. And uh, <laughs> by the way, that killed more people than any of the Ghana killed over the whole course of the series. That's for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Ghana didn't actually get into the ship at any point. Yeah. So that's one of the most terrifying moments, I would say, for the implications of the world. There's nobody she wouldn't sacrifice if she's willing to just kill thousands of random people right then. With the idea being that it's all for this, the greater good of preserving the human race, that this is the last bastion of... It's got a bit of that um, the new Battlestar Galactica feel to it. Oh, yes. <laughs> How would they do? I am the president of Toho Heavy Industries, and I lost the contract to manufacture giant robots. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. At one point, we thought we had it made. You know, my dad did this. My grandfather did this. We built giant robots for the defense of Sidonia. But then an upstart competitor came. One day I show up, and they're, everybody's talking about the Mark 17. And it's faster, and it's more agile. I'm like, why didn't we know about this? We've become complacent in our manufacturing. We thought it was okay to just, you know, change a few things here and there in every generation. And, but essentially just keep churning out the same giant robots. And that made us vulnerable to this side swipe. So I want to pledge apologies to my father, my grandfather, my whole family for letting this slip out of my hands. The one contract to build giant robots uh, I lost it to another company, and basically we're having a really hard time finding a market for our giant robots. Mm. Outside the, the realm of Guardians, there isn't a lot of demand. Yeah, outside of military things, I mean, we've been taking them to children's birthday parties, and there's mm. a certain amount of... The kneeling is especially useful there. Exactly, yeah. People laughed at me for putting knees on the robots, but hey, you know, it's not always going to be about fighting. The fingers are very good for making balloon animals. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, kids love to take little rides. But to be honest, it's not the same as the income from the military industrial complex. Thin times, thin times for Toho Heavy Industries. Nice. I am Norito, Norio Kunato, who is actually a character in this thing. But I thought he had kind of an interesting idea is he is the heir to the Kunato Development's fortune, who are the people who took over giant robot manufacturing. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. But more importantly, he is also the greatest guard pilot in the entirety of Sidonia until this weird kid showed up, who is like 15 or something. Wait, this uh, character is the one who looks like Lucius Malfoy, right? The With the long gray hair? Yes. Yes. Okay. I fly the, the Type 18 guard, which is what everyone flies. But there is a Type 17 guard that was one of the original ones that we built. And this kid shows up and gets adopted by the captain of the whole ship and the captain just goes oh yeah give him that antique amazing type 17 guard that i have been eyeing for basically my entire life because it's the greatest thing ever ever since it came to your birthday party yeah yeah it came to my birthday party and it was great and so he just takes it over and basically spends a lot of time completely messing everything up, but kind of pulling out at the last minute. Uh, he is terrible at any kind of squad tactics because he knows how to fly really well, but he's never flown with anybody else. So he uh -huh. continually goes off by himself. And then he actually like pulls it out and succeeds, which just makes it even worse because apparently he doesn't need anybody else in his squad. I don't know. It just reinforces that kind of behavior. Exactly. And so if everybody started doing that, the Ghana are just going to kick our ass. 
Yeah, your tactics often consist of forming a very, very nice, even long line. <laughs> and I bet if they went and made some sort of documentary about this whole going on right now, I would look like the bad guy. Hmm. History is told by the winners. Apparently so. Which used to be me. Right. <laughs> I'm rich. <laughs> Why aren't I the winner? I should be the one writing the histories. I'm going to mm. do that. You did kind of sabotage him there. You gave him the wrong information about caused him to blow his charge prematurely. Uh, okay, yes. There was that. But that was what I would call an extenuating circumstance. Uh, okay. Because he was a dick. <laughs> you can write that part out when you write the history. Yes, exactly. Hope for the future. So, at the end of the series, series one, this is the spoiler section, by the way. The more highly spoiler section. Basically, series one is them fighting a series of larger and larger Ghana until they fight and defeat a super Ghana at the end. Mm -hmm. That's made of like 200 Ghanas all grouped together. And they defeat that. And then series two, I've been reading about. And it seems to be more grim war. Yeah. It's, I mean, a lot, in a lot of ways, the series is like a series of encounters that they escape from with the, by the skin of their teeth over and over, you know, in various ways with various ramifications. And that sort of continues on. And then they, you know, they, they destroy this big super Ghana. But I don't think anybody is under the impression that that's like, oh, good. We defeated all the Ghana. Yay. Like they have no idea why they came or why they went away, why a big one is attacking them, why a small one's attacking them. So another terrible, terrifying attack could be right around the corner. Like, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I don't even know why they would take the time to celebrate if one could appear any second. Or one could not show up for a hundred years and then suddenly start coming again. Yeah, it's not good for your nerves. Yeah, and like, you know, in, in the, the other aspect is the sort of stated... A theoretical mission of this whole thing, you know, as with the, the people who were sort of conscientious objectors to the Ghana thing, is that theoretically at some point they're supposed to, you know, find a planet to land on, or not land on, but find a planet to colonize. But just the knowledge that there are these Ghana things are out there and that there's no reason why the same thing won't happen that happened to Earth. You know, a giant thing is going to come and smash it and destroy it and break it in half and force everyone to go off again. Like there's, and that could happen tomorrow or it could happen in a hundred years. The idea that something like a Ghana even exists in the universe basically makes it always dangerous. <laughs> makes the future completely unknowable, possibly final. Like mm -hmm. there's, the, humanity could be snuffed out at any time and they don't know why. Right. So, not super hopeful. Yeah, they did invent a kind of bullet that can do what the spears do. Yeah, that was good. That seems very hopeful. Yeah, I mean, if they could just... Why don't they just, you know, make a robot out of that stuff? <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, and then when the Ghana tries to attack it, just... I bet that that's like a stand-up comedian thing on Cydonia. It's like, why don't they make the playing out of all this, of the stuff they make the black box out of. <laughs> the Sidonia version of Gallagher? Yeah. Have you ever noticed when the gravity goes all funny and your hair goes upside down? And then he smashes some watermelon. Smashes a chunk of protoplasm with a hammer. But if that was as effective as I think it should be, the whole synopsis of the second series would be they shoot all the Ghana with guns and then go have a party. Yeah, they pull out a giant chain gun. Like, there seems to be such a huge difference between shooting a Ghana with a bullet and having it dissolve instantly and needing to get close enough to spear it. Mm-hmm. But it does not seem to play out that way. By and large, they're sort of a close-range thing. So, yeah, if you could figure out how to make them, uh, how to make more of that uh, artificial Ghana-destroying stuff, then that's going to be definitely the way to go. 
That's what they should put all their effort into, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But nobody wants to listen to me, apparently. Apparently not. They'd all rather see Clone Gallagher. <laughs> Gallagher 2. <laughs> That's who Gallagher 2 was? Oh, <laughs> yep. That makes so much sense now. Tani Kaze! You're awake? Huh? Oh, hold on, I'm photosynthesizing. Uh, sorry! You can keep going. I won't look. Okay, thanks. That helps since I just started. Tanikaze? Yeah. Hmm? Where did you learn emergency protocols? Oh. I learned everything about that from my grandfather. The one you lived underground with? Yeah. You were so effective without having had much in the way of training yet, so I was actually a little surprised. I was always told that. You should do whatever you have to do to survive in any situation. He was a good grandfather. Yeah. He taught me a lot of things. Hail, hail, Sidonia, land of the free and strong. Ooh. That's what their theme song should be. That's their that's their anthem. Mm -hmm. Actually, it kind of does sound like a martial anthem. What they have, the theme song yeah, yeah. for the show. Yeah, a extremely long intro. The show. <laughs> yeah, it's a twenty-five minute episode, and two minutes are a recap, two minutes are the theme song, and then two minutes are the end theme song. So mm -hmm. I was able to get through this series pretty fast. Uh, my first anime in 15 years. Oh, really? Yeah. To be honest, it's no patch on Ranma Half or Tenchi Muyo. <laughs> State-of-the-art anime when I started watching. Why can't we have good old anime like Card Captor Sakura? Yeah, that's when anime was really trying to tell something interesting, tell all sorts of intriguing stories. That's right. It was dark. It was layered. So that mm. was... Knights of Sidonia. Yeah. And this is a Loading Ready Run podcast as sponsored by uh, all you awesome people on our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. For those of you who don't know, uh, we've got our load bearing wall of gratitude uh, in our new moon base. And uh, it's pretty awesome that uh, we're able to have this new loca new location, and over the next little while, you're going to see more stuff filmed there, and we'll be able to see, show you how awesome it is. I'm looking forward to all the new videos with an expanded number of locations, like your new location, a different office. Mm-hmm. We've got different rooms now. The rooms are it's... a different shape and size. We've got one room that has a window that slides open and closed. So, you know, that just opens up an entire thing right there. That gets a filmmaker's creativity humming. Yeah, yeah. Windows that open and close. So uh, if you like this podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or rate and review it as well. We always are interested to hear what you have to say. If you don't like this podcast, then what are you doing with your life? You just listened to 45 minutes of a podcast. Like you could have... Mm been doing literally anything else if you don't like this podcast maybe uh send it to somebody you don't like uh and Sabotage. be like hey you should you should listen to this it's really interesting but you have to listen to the whole thing so maybe that's the person who's listening and doesn't like it mm -hmm. yeah oh well sorry you got tricked yeah it I doesn't get any better right at the end <laughs> you can also Leave us comments on our forum at loadingreadyrun.com slash forum. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, and we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and I shall die for someone else. I shall fall on the battlefield. And may the odds always be in your favor. All right. Bye. Ciao, ciao.
Ci vediamo! <ride> Perfetto!